Hi and welcome. You're listening to Historic Huguenot Street's weekly program on WFNP The Edge, where we discuss regional New Paltz history and upcoming programs and events. I'm Caitlin Glucci, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at Historic Huguenot Street, which is a nonprofit 10-acre National Historic Landmark District dedicated to preserving historic buildings, artifacts, and manuscripts, and promoting the stories of the Huguenot Street families, descendants, and inhabitants, including the indigenous Asopus Muncie people and enslaved Africans from the 17th century to today. If you heard our recent shows, you know that Historic Huguenot Street is currently showing two exhibitions which recognize the Dutch influence in our region and celebrate the Dutch culture that flourished in the 1600s and 1700s when New York State was the colony of New Netherland. These exhibitions are installed in the Jean Hasbrook House, which is an exceptional example of traditional 18th century Dutch architecture in the Hudson Valley. One exhibit called Living in Style, Selections from the George Way Collection of Dutch Fine and Decorative Art, features over 100 17th and 18th century Dutch items from the Netherlands installed in one room in the Jean Hasbrook House to give an immersive experience of what a Dutch room from that period would have looked and felt like. Another exhibit in both the Jean Hasbrook House and the Abraham Hasbrook House features over a dozen Hudson Valley made costin, which are Dutch style cupboards. Historic Huguenot Street actually houses one of the largest collections of Hudson Valley costin in the country. This exhibition gathers pieces from several prominent regional public and private collections. You can find out more information on both of those exhibitions on our website at huguenotstreet.org. And you can also register for special tours as well. The last of these special tours are coming up next month. Collector George Way will be leading a tour of the Living in Style exhibition on December 9th at 2 p.m. And Sanford Levy will be leading a tour of the Costin exhibition on December 16th at 2 p.m. Sanford Levy's tour of the Costin exhibition also takes guests to the Abraham Hasbrook House, so you'll get to see more than what is normally on view. Otherwise, those exhibitions are on view during our regular guided tours, which are now available weekends only through Sunday, December 17th, and otherwise by appointment. You can find information about scheduling a tour at HuguenotStreet.org. And remember, regular tours are free for SUNY New Paltz students with student IDs. Tonight, we'll be discussing an event that's coming up this Saturday called Huguenot Cider, European Heritage in a Glass. Right now, I'm joined by Tim Dressel of Dressel Farms and Kettleboro Cider House, both right here in New Paltz. Hi, Tim. Hello. Thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. Um, so can you tell us a bit about your role at Dressel Farms and Kettleboro Cider House? Sure, yeah. Um, I have lived on the farm my whole life. Um, I'm the fourth generation to uh, farm apples here in New Paltz as uh, Dressel Farms. Cool. Um, and uh, I graduated from Cornell about 10 years ago and returned to the farm to work full time with my family. Uh, I still work full time as a Dressel Farms employee, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, I've started Kettleboro Cider House uh, as my own kind of pet project. Um, oh, been, nice. Yeah, it's been about five years now. Um, and uh, certainly for the first uh, few years and, and even now, it's been kind of an evening and weekend uh, sort of hobby business, if you will. Okay. Um, but uh, we've grown to a point now and uh, I've started to take a little bit of a step back from Dressel Farms and work more towards a hard cider. But uh, on the farm, uh, everybody asks me kind of what I do and it's a, a hard, <laughs> hard question to answer because there's a lot of things I do and uh, my day to day is very unpredictable. But uh, sure. I'm very involved uh, with the management of the farm um, and uh, kind of sneak in hard cider fermentation when I can. <laughs> Cool. Um, so what sparked your interest in hard cider and like led you to s open Kettleboro Cider House? Uh, so when I was at college, um, I was up in the Finger Lakes. And uh, if you've ever been to the Finger Lakes, it's a very uh, wine centric region. Um, there's sure. uh, wineries up and down um, all the lakes there um, due to the climate that uh, makes growing grapes there uh, very easy or easier than other places in the state. So I got really into um, touring the wineries and, and learning some of the things. And I worked at a couple of them while I was there and uh, came home to my farm and uh, kind of wanted to make my own sort of niche. Um, and uh, so I figured I'd plant a vineyard and teach myself how to grow grapes and learn how to ferment things and start a winery. Um, mm -hmm. That was in 2008. And uh, hard cider 
um, wasn't really that popular back then. Uh, it was only in about 2010, 2011 that uh, hard cider really became kind of a national phenomenon and and, sure. and uh, really picked up in in, uh, in popularity. So uh, I planted the, the grapes and, and started that project. And um, it takes about five years to get a decent crop off a, a, a vineyard. So in the time it took for the grapes to mature and grow, hard cider, you know, Good got a foothold. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So uh, uh, I looked around and I said, well, I have three acres of grapes and I have 300 acres of apples at my disposal. Sure. So kind of a natural uh, choice at that point. Yeah. Um, and I always liked hard cider. Um, being mm -hmm. from an apple family, you have a natural uh, oh, draw sure. towards that apples. Right of course. So yeah. <laughs> um, I had been uh, dabbling in uh, hard cider even before it was popular. So I uh, had a lot of the European things that were being imported, I'd find it at beer stores and things like that. So um, the process of making uh, hard cider is actually very similar to making white wine. So it was a very natural transition in that sense as well. So, you know, the whole whole thing was pretty natural, actually. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so when you, when you decided to plant a vineyard, so there had not been one previously at Dressel Farms? This was the first time? Uh, I'm told there was one before I was alive. Oh, okay. That doesn't count. <laughs> no, no, I guess not. <laughs> uh, there, there was not currently one there when I planted it, no. Okay, no. cool. Um, I, I came back, uh, and as anyone does when they graduate college, you're very enthusiastic and, and uh, wide-eyed and ready to <laughs> you know take on the world. And uh, I guess my ambition was impressive enough that uh, my father and grandfather gave me uh, a couple acres that they weren't really using at the time, I guess, and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, kind of told me to go nuts. Uh, so that was nice of them, but uh, yeah, the grapes are still there, um, and uh, I've actually planted more since then. But I've definitely uh, turned my focus to hard cider. Sure. Um, so, what inspired this new Huguenot cider? So, uh, actually, this goes back quite a ways. Um, oh, okay. Uh, when um, I first started this whole thing, um, way back in 2010. Um, there were these, even at that point, there had been some uh, kind of uh, improvement in the hard cider market. And, um, you know, I had kind of been going back and forth. I hadn't started Kettleboro officially yet, um, but I was going in that direction. And uh, we work very closely, the farm does, with um, uh, the local uh, Cornell Agricultural uh, Experimentation Lab that's over in Highland. Oh, okay, cool. Um, and uh, they they do a lot of research over there. Uh, um, a lot with apples, but also other fruits and things like that. And through some channel or another, they had actually planted um, some European hard cider apple varieties uh, on their plot. And uh, they didn't really need them. They weren't really using them for anything. They were just kind of taking up space, and they were ready to plow them under. Okay. And someone, thankfully, said, hey, Tim Dressel's been talking about hard cider <laughs> lately. Maybe we should give him a call before we knock these things out. So they did, and I, I went over, and I actually I took about five guys over the next day, and we hand dug up 60 apple trees and uh, moved them over to our place in New Paltz. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was a uh, quite the endeavor. <laughs> yeah, um, I bet. Most of them survived the uh, the transplant, thankfully. Okay. And, um, and uh, you know, I was off and rolling from there. And uh, when I started making hard cider commercially, um, I've been using uh, the normal apples that go along with um, everyday eating apples, uh, Macintosh and Empire and Red Delicious and things like that. But sure. these uh, European apples that I started off with, um, I, I knew that they were going to be something special when, when, uh, the time came. And then, uh, I was fortunate enough to be chosen to go, uh, on a really neat, uh, trip over to French wine country. And we toured a lot of the, the cider wine country, French cider country. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, we toured a lot of the, the cider places over there and, and learned how, uh, French make hard cider. And, um, they came here and learned about our hard cider as well. And they kind of scoffed at the fact that we used... Uh, Red Delicious oh, and, and, okay. and Macintosh and things like that. They're like, this this isn't cider. <laughs> um, so French snobbery aside, they uh, taught me how uh, the European heritage thing kind of um, plays into hard cider and, and the, the traditions that are you know, akin to French wine traditions. And um, so when these European apples that I planted came around, I wanted to kind of emulate what I learned in France and... Um, decided that uh, to make a, a, a blend that was purely European apples and uh, I needed a name and Huguenot was a pretty natural <laughs> uh, association. Nice. Um, 
So what is it, what what would you say makes, how are these apples different? What what are some of the thing, characteristics that make them like European? Right. So uh, when I talk about this in the tasting room, uh, I'm like, hey, these are French and uh, there's English apples in there as well. Um, they're like, oh, so you imported these from England? And, no, no, they're they're actually planted <laughs> here, um, but uh, their origins date back to to French and English uh, heritage. So um, these are tremendously old apples. Some of the ones uh, I'm I'm growing now were discovered back in like the 15, 1600s and wow. have been propagated ever since then. So you know, a couple hundred years of the same apple variety that have been you know saved to make hard cider. Mm -hmm. um, the difference that you'd find in these apples is that they're not the kind of apples you'd ever want to eat. Um, oh, okay. Right. So <laughs> they're uh, either uh, really ugly apples, you know, tiny <laughs> ones or misshapen or, or whatever, or um, they have bad texture or bad flavor. Um, a lot of them are very bitter. Um, some are like really astringent, like you bite into them and they just puck your face right up. Mm -hmm. um, so they never make it on a grocery store shelf. Sure. But when you take these apples and, and you blend them together in uh, in make juice out of them, uh, you're able to get flavors that are completely unattainable with Macintosh and Red Delicious. Um, and that's because the uh, uh, makeup, the chemical makeup and, and the, you know, the esters and all the things in these apples that make them taste terrible um, when you're eating them fresh uh, are the same kind of things that make uh, wine have characteristics and complexity and depth and things like that. It's tannins, and uh, other things that uh, have been strategically bred out of the apples that you and I are used to eating today. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So uh, it gives you a much more complex, much more interesting uh, flavor that you're able to analyze much more like wine rather than you pick up a cider and you drink it. And, you know, if you're used to something that you're buying off the grocery store shelf, it's something that's going to mm -hmm. have that apple-y flavor and, and right. you know, be kind of fuzzy apple juice. Um, whereas this is a much more rustic, much more authentic, much more uh, interesting flavor. Cool. Uh, right now, we're going to take a quick break. This is WFNP The Edge. Hi, and welcome back. You're listening to Historic Huguenot Street's weekly program on WFNP The Edge. I'm Caitlin Gallucci, and I'm joined by Tim Dressel of Dressel Farms and Kettleboro Cider House. Tim will be giving a presentation at Historic Huguenot Street this Saturday at 4 p.m. called Huguenot Cider, European Heritage in a Glass. Guests will also have the opportunity to taste Kettleboro Cider House's new Huguenot Cider. The event will pl take place at Dale Hall, not the Dale Hall on campus, but the Dale Hall at 6 Broadhead Avenue. You can register for the event at HuguenotStreet.org and just navigate to our calendar of events. Um, so like we were talking about before the break, um, you know, I would assume based on these different types of apples that then Huguenot cider is different from other hard ciders. What do you think people will like? What, what would people like about Huguenot cider? What are the, some of the differences? So you're right. It is very different. First of all. <laughs> um, and actually, uh, it, it made it, uh, if I can expand a little bit on that, of course. um, so we run a tasting room on, on the farm and uh, we right now are making four different hard ciders. Mm. And uh, this one is by far the most unique on the list. Um, and that actually made it difficult when we were adding it to the tasting roster, uh, figuring out where it fit uh, oh, among point. the, the yeah. order. So um, if you've ever been to a wine tasting or a beer tasting or things like that, there's usually a suggested order in which you should try things. Um, you never want to taste like a super sweet wine and then go back to something that's really dry. It'll, it's going to, you know, mess up your palate. It's going to, you know, in, with uh, the different flavors, you want to make sure you're, you're tasting things in the correct order as far as uh, how the, the cider maker or winemaker wanted you to. Mm -hmm. So it's so different that we were having a tough time figuring out where around the thing it should go. And we ended up putting it right at the beginning so that we could be like, listen, this is super different. <laughs> the rest are not going to be like this. Let this one kind of stand alone. And then we'll get to the rest of things. So sure. um, first off, Americans uh, have been kind of uh, convinced that all ciders are going to have uh, carbonation like beer would. Mm -hmm. um, and that's generally true um, with American ciders because um, cider makers, just like anyone else that's trying to sell a product, is going to make something that you want to drink or something that you expect to drink. 
Sure. Um, so first off, what you're going to notice um, when you taste two gun cider is that it doesn't have any sparkle. It's a still cider. So uh, a lot of people have compared it to a wine or an apple wine or things like that. Mm. Um, the real appreciation for this comes in when you uh, recognize kind of what goes into the production of it and how it brings together um, both, you know, the ancient uh, cider making techniques that have survived through France for the last couple hundred years, um, kind of coming into America and finding its place here. So uh, it's a very, uh, we call it rustic flavor, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, it's a farmhouse style cider. So it's, um, it's uh, naturally fermented. There's no added yeast or sugar or anything. It's a very hands-off process as far as that goes. Oh, interesting. Um, and uh, it's rather dry. Um, and it has uh, that sort of um, farmhouse quality that uh, comes through in uh, like Saison beers. If you ever had a Saison beer, mm -hmm. um, it's uh, a very full flavored, complex thing that you can start picking out different flavors all from you can get the apple flavor in there but you're also gonna you're gonna get some uh some spice and uh other things that you just can't pick up when you're having uh, sorry to throw them under the bus angry orchard that's okay <laughs> <laughs> um so uh in that sense um it's become a very big hit in our taste room and i think it's because uh it has this story attached to it and this history sure. to it that's really cool um so you mentioned the tasting room. What other types, what other ciders are available? Right. So uh, as I said, this one is completely different. Sure. The, uh, the, first, cider, <laughs> the first cider I ever made um, is actually no longer in production. That's a long story to that. Um, but most of our ciders skew towards uh, drier styles. Um, okay. Another thing that Americans consider hard cider to be in general, if you, you know, poll 100 people, mm -hmm. you're going to find that people are just like, oh, hard cider is sweet. Well, mm -hmm. hard cider doesn't have to be sweet. It's just made sweet because people like to buy sweet things. Sure. Um, so when you're getting more into the craftier hard ciders, you're going to find that a lot of them are um, kind of going in more of a wine direction than a beer one and uh, taking on a drier characteristic. So mm -hmm. um, we have a cider that's simply called dry cider. And um, it's my personal favorite. It's the one I drink most often. Um, we make it with, uh, Granny Smith apples, which everyone knows, you know, tart green apple. Sure. And, uh, one that is not quite as popular called Northern Spy, which is, uh, one of the few heirloom American hard cider varieties. It's not really hard cider, I guess, but heirloom apple varieties, uh, from America that's still somewhat commonly grown. Mm -hmm. Um, so the Granny Smith gives it this nice, uh, uh tart taste but then uh, the northern spy which is generally now used as a baking apple kind of rounds it out gives it a little more of apple pie flavor on the end it's nice oh, cool. um, but it's bone dry and we call it apple prosecco kind of as a little pet oh, name nice. that's uh, if i could tell you over the radio how it tastes it tastes like it apple sounds prosecco. delicious <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, a good way to describe yeah, it no, yeah it, it, and it's it's great it's very refreshing it's it's nice and crisp and um goes well with thanksgiving dinner shameless plug nice um <laughs> the uh uh, second one on our tasting list, if we're going by tasting order, oh, yeah, will, sure. um, is uh, called Lightly Hopped. Uh, hops like in beer. Sure. Um, fairly recent uh, revelation. Someone somewhere had <laughs> some genius decided, hey, let's throw some hops in this cider and uh, figured out that the, the flavor uh, combination actually goes really, really well. Um, so if you have any beer makers out there, it's a dry hopped uh, cider. We're using Cascade hops. And uh, rather than being... A super bitter uh, thing like you'd find like an IPA. You know, most people associate hops with an IPA. Mm -hmm. Instead of being that super bitter, Cascade hops are actually more of an aroma hop, and it gives it a very fruity, citrusy, almost floral-like flavor. Um, so uh, I always tell people kind of think like rose petals when you're drinking it, and that's actually kind of what comes oh, out. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's it's a different cider, but um, that was if I had a second favorite, that would be it. That's what I drank yeah. all summer. <laughs> And then uh, our best seller uh, is called Honey Honey. Oh, okay. And uh, it gets its name from uh, what we flavor it with, which is uh, honey crisp apple juice and wildflower honey. Um, so uh, we actually ferment an apple called Stamen Wine Sap, which is another older variety. Um, but then after that's done fermenting, we take uh, honey crisp apples and we grind them up. And uh, we take the juice and blend wildflower honey into it and put that whole 
mix right into the tank. So it sweetens it, flavors it, gives it a nice smooth sweetness. But uh, we always say sweet, but not too sweet. It ends on a nice crisp uh, uh, note that keeps it light and refreshing. So it's not weighing you down with sugar. Sure. Um, and then we actually do uh, go back to our origins. We have one wine on our list uh, that we're oh, making. Okay. So uh, those grapes that I mentioned way back at the beginning, those, yeah. those are still around and, and uh, you know, got some still, have, out of still have to be yeah. used in some way. So we are making one wine as well, too. Nice. Um, so obviously people get a chance to taste um, the Huguenot cider this Saturday at Huguenot Street. But otherwise, with all these other ciders, um, where are these all available? You can tell us where the tasting room right, is. Right, right, or... yeah. Um, so uh, we have our tasting room open. Um, during the fall, we have it open weekends. Um, right now, uh, November and December, we're open Saturdays only, um, mm -hmm. 12 to 5. And uh, it's right on the farm, Dressel Farms on 208, uh, going south out of town. Um, only about a three-minute drive from campus, which is nice. Cool. Um, but, uh, yep, we have a tasting room set up right there. You can taste all the things I just mentioned. All of them are available there to buy. Uh, we have a couple uh, extra New York State products that we uh, uh, are friendly with, a couple distilleries, uh, another uh, another couple wineries around that uh, we like to help promote. Um, cool. So you can come in, try it all. Um, it's also available, uh, all the ciders at uh, any of the liquor stores in town, um, as well as uh, Caney, the, uh, the beer oh, okay. store there. Um, that's actually one of the neat things about hard cider in New York State. It's the only beverage that's allowed to be sold both in liquor stores and wine stores. So oh, interesting. There's your fun legal fact for the day. Yeah, no, that is <laughs> really funny. <laughs> Great. Um, well, Tim, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Sure. Uh, once again, Tim Dressel's talk and hard cider tasting will be this Saturday at Dale Hall, 6 Broadhead Avenue at 4 p.m. You can register for the event online at HuguenotStreet.org. Historic Huguenot Street has also announced the schedule for a holiday on Huguenot Street, which is a two-day celebration of the season organized in collaboration with the Reformed Church of New Paltz, which will take place on Friday, December 1st and Saturday, December 2nd. This includes our annual community tree lighting, which will be at 7 p.m. on Friday, December 1st. The schedule also includes holiday-themed tours of the historic houses, uh, the Reformed Church's annual craft fair, a free concert by the Big Blue Big Band, horse-drawn wagon rides, holiday photos, a cookie sale, uh, benefiting local food pantries, and so much more. You can see the whole schedule at huguenotstreet.org slash holiday, and we'll be talking more about that event uh, on our next show. So we're wrapping up now, but listeners can tune in every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. for the rest of the semester, which isn't much longer at WFNP.org or 88.7 FM to hear more from Historic Huguenot Street. Visit HuguenotStreet.org for information on all of our upcoming events and follow us on social media to stay informed on what's happening on the street. Thanks for listening.